Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the On the Blue Line podcast with Wayne Mulder, and I am your host, Wayne Mulder. I know, it's very confusing the things that go on around here, but thank you for coming back. Thank you for listening to another episode. You may be watching this. Uh, We do put these episodes out on our YouTube channel. You can also go to the website and watch them through there, onthebluelinecom forward slash watch. And I hope that you will or are. And I appreciate you listening. I've got another great episode for you this week. I know I say that every week, but uh, this week is no exception. Uh, On the podcast is John Becker. He spent four decades dedicating himself to protecting tactical operators. He is the founder and CEO of Aardvark Tactical, which is a provider of tactical equipment and custom solutions and the founder of the armor manufacturer Project 7 which this conversation about what he did with Aardvark is fascinating, and it's only one part of this conversation. You're really going to enjoy hearing about his journey through law school, him working with some of the world's top law enforcement and military units, and then his uh, time now that he really is giving back to the community, giving back to the law enforcement community, the spec ops community, and the military, uh, just through this wonderful podcast and video that he has, which is called The Debrief. I'm telling you the professional quality of that. I say it over and over again, but it, it's outstanding. And the information and the emotional uh, pull into these stories is incredible. I personally have been watching them. And I am suggesting that you do as well because you're going to enjoy them and you're going to get a lot out of those broadcast as well. Becker resides in Los Angeles, California with his children and his wife of 32 years. And when he's not doing these exciting things, he's uh, running Ironman triathlons, racing sports cars, and speaking for tactical organizations around the country. It was absolutely a pleasure having the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Becker. And I know that you're going to enjoy this conversation as much as I did having it. So without taking any more time, here's this week's guest, John Becker. Well, John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, this is a blast to get to sit down. I tell you, I've been able to listen to a little bit of your story, and I know the listeners are going to definitely enjoy what we get into tonight. But let me start with, like I always do, my get to know you questions, my break the ice questions I like to throw out to everybody. So let's start real easy. This is the softball one, coffee or tea? Ice tea. Ice tea. You are the second person back to back episodes. Ice tea is the winner. Has you have you ever yes. been a coffee drinker? No, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, growing up, I mean, you know, my entire life's been surrounded by coffee. So you think I would have picked up the coffee habit, right? And uh, and it, it I, I've never loved coffee, and I've never particularly loved hot tea. Uh, my actual drink of choice would be Coca Cola. Okay, but it, it's not exactly good for your girlish figure. Uh, <laughs> So I, I've, I've moved on to, uh, to iced tea as my primary uh, drug of choice. I love it. Any favorite place to have that drink? I think, you know, I mean, I'm a Californian, right? So it's, it's always the beach is always the right answer. Un- um, yes. Even here in Florida, <laughs> that's the right answer as well. Even though the summers yes. may not be the best time to be at the beach, as we've discussed. Yeah, well, I'm currently in Memphis where it is pouring rain. So I'm, I'm looking out the window of my hotel and it, it looks like a beach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, us Floridians, we we can understand exactly what you're saying. I, the thing I don't understand is the water falling from the sky. That's that's deeply troubling to me as a Californian. Yeah, yes, especially Southern California. <laughs> I hear I hear the stories. Yes, for sure. So um, I have to ask, best or worst travel story? Do you have one? <sighs> I'm going to say best travel story. Uh, when my son graduated from high school, we took a family trip to Japan, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and, you know, had, had a lot of amazing food and a lot of fun, just really good family time. Yeah. Uh, so most of my happy travel memories all revolve around family trips. That's great. Yeah. And, that, and those making those memories is where it's really at anyway. So for sure. One last question. I usually go down the book route and you can always uh, redirect the question there if that's easier for you. But let me ask, do you have a go-to music? Like if you're stressed or excited, do you have a go-to song or go-to style of music for you? So uh, they say that your favorite music is the music that you listen to in high school, which I think is still for me true. So it's all 80s music and it's, I'm not, I'm not particular. Uh, I have really eclectic music taste. It could be anything from country to heavy metal. 
I love um, it. but it's kind of that, that 80s genre. Now, most of the time, what I listen to when I'm working out or driving, uh, is podcasts. Yep. Same here. I, I, I find it interesting how we kind of, like you said, you, you really like everything and it all comes from that era for me, more late eighties, early nineties, but still in that era of music that you grew up with. And it's really what I default to, but now it's all about the podcast and learning what I can, um, from other people. Yeah, we, I, I spend, you know, a lot of time working out, driving, traveling, and uh, it used to be I looked for kind of mindless entertainment. Now, I, every time I'm trying to do something with my brain, I, I as a hobby, I do Ironman distance triathlete, triathlon. So I, I find that uh, for really long bike rides, podcasts keep you from, you know, they give you the ability to ignore the suffering. I'm sure. Now, let me go into that for just a second. Now, do you listen to... Uh, podcast when you're both biking and running. And the reason yes. I ask is some of these other triathletes and distance runners, uh, such as like Rich Roll and some of these other guys that I listen to talk about how for them, when they run, they actually don't want to listen to anything because it's more of a mind numbing exercise where they kind of just get in the zone and they're actually not listening. They don't want to listen to music because it screws up their cadence and they don't want to listen to like podcast or anything because they just kind of want to get in the zone and be in their own thoughts. So I think, I think for me, it depends if it's really short, hard running, if I'm doing intervals, it's usually heavy metal. Okay. Uh, it's, it's suffer music. If it's really long run where I know I'm going to get bored, it's podcast. There is a sweet spot between like 30 and 60 minutes where I can go listen to nothing, turn off my brain. And I find that a lot of my best thinking takes place while running that, uh, you know, I can kind of take a topic at the beginning of the run and you're just kind of turning it over while you're running. And most of the time that I write, uh, a lot of the questions that come from the podcast come from just thinking while running. So yeah, I, I, I agree with them. There's, there is a magic hypnosis to running that nothing yeah. else gives me. And that's what I've heard. A lot of them liken it to even like a meditation practice. It's yeah. just, it really gets them in the zone. Totally agree. Well, let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit, John. Um, let's start with the kind of the beginning of your story, and then we'll come through. Like, I know uh, you're a business guy, so maybe walk us through a little bit of what brought you to the business world and uh, kind of how it started, maybe the origin story a little bit. Yeah, so the origin story is I, I, I start at 17, I leave high school uh, and go to college. I, I left high school early, went to college. Um, and my first year of college, I meet a girl who works for a rock climbing wholesaler. And uh, she says, hey, we're, you know, we climb with them on the weekends. And she says, hey, we're bringing in this camming device. We should start a mail order business and sell this thing because nobody's going to have it. I said, okay, yeah, you know, it sounds like fun. And so she, she flaked right away because she had a job and she was going to college and whatever. And uh, so I started selling rock climbing equipment from my mom's den. Literally, my, my business was a desk in my mom's den, uh, in, you know, in, in a 75 square foot den, um, selling rock climbing equipment. And I grew up in a military family. Dad was a Navy captain. Brother was a special forces guy. And so I, I started dealing with SWAT teams and military special operations groups that were buying ropes and harnesses and carabiners. And I just kind of drifted in that direction. And because I grew up around that, I was comfortable with it. Uh, always been very pro law enforcement, always been very pro military. And so by the time I'm 18, 19 years old, I'm selling more military style, you know, static line ropes and carabiners and, you know, figure eights, rescue eights. Um, and the business started to drift in that direction. I never wanted to be a sales guy. It's just not like I didn't, I didn't want to be that used car salesman. So I thought I better know more about the gear than they do. Yeah, because then I'm a consultant, like then I serve some value other than, hey, you know, want to buy a rope. Um, and so I started learning very deeply about the equipment. And as I started to deal with more and more units, they started asking for other things. You know, they, hey, can you get us Eagle nylon gear? And say, so, well, I don't I don't know anything about Eagle. Oh, you know, call this guy and get set up. And we'll buy our Eagle from you. And, and it just drifted into a more military and law enforcement direction. And at some point they started asking me for things that I knew nothing about. Right. And so I'd say, I don't, I don't know anything about, it. you know, can you get us chemical agents? I don't know anything about chemical agents. Uh, you know, do you know where I can get training? Do you know where I can learn more? Oh, dude, come down. You, you know, go through a chemical agents class with us. 
And so my rule was I would never turn down free training. And so by the time I'm 25, I've got about 3,000 hours of special tactics training. I mean, I've been through, you know, MP5 school and M4 school and handgun, shotgun, pursuit driving. I audited a couple of SWAT schools. I, you know, chemical agents class, flashbangs class. Um, and what I didn't know at the time, and I now realize, is that the guys who were training me were the originators of a lot of the tactics and techniques that, that I was learning about. So, you know, I, I learned to throw a flashbang from Sid Hale, who is, is still regarded as the national expert, recently died, but, uh, you know, the national expert on diversionary devices. He was the guy that was writing all the articles. He literally wrote the NTOA's manual on flashbangs. So it's kind of a, you know, I, you know, I, I guess Michael Jordan taught me to play basketball is, right. the, is the easiest way to, to explain it. And as the business started to develop, we started dealing with more military units and more, you know, federal agencies, it just became diversified. And we started to have this kind of broader skill set. And uh, so I went to law school. And when I, while I was in law school, everything I wrote on, everything I researched was law enforcement related. Uh, I was lucky enough to secure a two-year clerkship at the LAPD police litigation unit, which just by dumb luck happened to be when Rodney King was happening. Lucky you. So, <laughs> lucky me. So I worked on the Rodney King case. I worked on the Reginald Denny case. Uh, I worked on, this is when, when law enforcement litigation was starting to take off. So dog bite cases had just started. Okay. We had, we had dog bite cases. We had protest cases. Police lit handled the kind of top tier of, of cases for, for the city of Los Angeles. So it was, you know, 100 plaintiffs, 100 defendants, uh, or certain attorneys, uh, Johnny Cochran being one of them, uh, the ACLU being another, that if, if the city was sued for the actions of the police department. And I worked for an amazing lawyer there, a guy named Corey Brent, who educated me about the legal aspects of what I was doing. And I kind of fused those two. So I started writing on tactical topics. Everything I wrote in law school, I tried to gear towards tactical topics. I ended up publishing a law review article about media interference in tactical situations and ended up writing a two-part series for the National Tactical Officer Association on flashbangs. And so it's just like those two came together. And then when I got out of law school, I, I had been working for lawyers that didn't have insurance companies and that did the right thing every time right uh, when you get into civil litigation you realize it's the insurance company and they don't care if the cop did the right thing or not right it comes down to the bottom yeah. line and yeah. exposure exactly and, and the idea that you know you're going to take an officer who's been in a life-threatening situation has defended himself and you're going to give the guy he shot money just didn't sit well and so at about 25 years old, so we're seven years in, we're doing military business. Uh, I, I distinctly remember sitting down with my wife at the kitchen table and saying, so I know we just spent all of our money on me going to law school, but I don't think I want to practice law. How did that conversation uh, go over? You know, surprisingly, it, it went better than I thought it would. Uh, and I've been with her now for 32 years, so she was dumb enough to stick around. Um but no, it, it, uh, the business had grown to the point where it was kind of, I would make more money as a lawyer, but I enjoyed my life more. What was the push for wanting to go through law school in the first place while building the business? So, yeah, I went to college. I got out of college. I wanted to do an advanced degree. Um, law was interesting to me, especially with all the law enforcement agencies I was dealing with. Um, it seemed like a really good degree. It, it, and honestly, at that point, I thought I'll probably just become a lawyer. Okay. You know, I could become a deputy district attorney. I can, you know, I, I could do civil law enforcement, civil litigation. And I didn't really think, even then, seven years in, I didn't really think the business was going to be a livelihood for me. But I, the thing I didn't understand that now, you know, retrospectively at 54, looking back at the business and seeing kind of why it's been successful was the guys that brought me up had, had, polluted my brain so to speak they had they had built a culture for our business 
because I really cared about my end user. Right. Because the guys I was putting armor on were the guys that were in my wedding and they were guys that, you know, I was vacationing with and seeing on the weekends and, and it created this very personal relationship for me between my end user and what I did. And there were a couple of events, um, one, one I can share with you that profoundly impacted the way I looked at what I did okay. and the consequences of my job. Um, and, and the one, the one I'll share with you is there was a Glendora police officer named Louis Pompey and, uh, Louis was off duty in a grocery store. Uh, the grocery store gets robbed. He, you know, decides he's not going to get involved until they start pistol whipping a special needs box boy. So at that point he draws a gun, engages who he thinks is the suspect. There is another suspect that he doesn't see that shoots and kills him. Jeez. And and I didn't know Louis. I mean, I knew a lot of people around Louis. It was an agency we were dealing with. But Louis and I were not personal friends. But at that point, we were in Arcadia. And the Arcadia Police Department, I, I literally knew every single person on the Arcadia Police Department. I had fit them all for body armor. Um, I knew them all by name. I would see them on the weekends. And uh, so I went to the funeral with Arcadia Police Department with one of the most jovial human beings I've, I've ever known. It was a guy named Joe Bale. Joe had a joke for everybody, right? Joe was, he was the six, six, three, 300 pound, you know, behemoth of a man that everybody had a joke. Everybody got a hug. He was that guy. Yeah. And I sat behind Joe at the wedding and Joe and Louie were close friends. And I watched Joe decompose at his funeral. I mean, absolutely sobbing, yeah. it just uh, inconsolable. And, and watched the whole thing play out with Louie's family and I remember walking out and saying to my wife, this is going to permanently change me. I'm never going to be the same after this. And she said, why? And I said, because this is what happens if we screw up. Yeah. Right. If armor doesn't work, if gear doesn't work, this is the consequence of our actions. And it, it just changed me. It just, you know, and, and every subsequent funeral I went to, I just had this very personal relationship with my end user that that carries on to today and as, as we started doing bigger and bigger business and more military stuff and, you know where i was dealing with a program manager and i was never going to meet my end user you know right. my end user was a a 20 year old kid standing a post in afghanistan i found myself always on the side of the end user and yeah. arguing with program managers about like this isn't going to work you need better gear this this gear isn't going to, you know, this is going to hold up. You're, you're putting your end users in danger. And sometimes at my peril, not everybody receives that feedback well. No. Um, <laughs> in general, there's a lot of feedback people don't receive well. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and you're making a mistake and screwing your end user is one of those, one of those things. Yeah. But it's just, you know, so by the time I'm out of law school and, and the, the business is growing and this is kind of where I am, I realize like this is a call. This is, you know, I, I look at my end user, even today, I look at the people in the industry and how many of them don't care about the end user. And, and so I see myself as being responsible for my end user's safety, uh, much in the way that like a medieval armor or whatever, Right. you know, there was a very personal relationship between the guy that made your armor for you and, and the knight. And, yes. and that's, that is our role. Right. My, my job is to be as smart as I possibly can to reduce the likelihood that when you put yourself in harm's way, something bad happens. And, you know, it come full circle to Ardvark Grows, we create our own armor brand called Project 7. Yeah, I was going to um, ask about that. Yeah, so so what happened was I, I'm very particular about gear. Okay. Um, I, I, I really care about quality. I care about how well it works on the operator. I think because I was brought up by SWAT teams and spent so much time with them training and moving and shooting, there's this very personal relationship between, you know, a guy and his gear. Right. And, and I understand that at a very deep level. So I, I became very frustrated with the armor industry and I could never get what I wanted for my end user, you know, and, and it's, 
and part of that's because I'm very picky and part of that's because the niche of the market that I deal with is a very small niche. Right. You know, 85% of the armor industries concealable body armor for patrol. Tactical is a very small part of the industry. And so I finally got frustrated enough that I built an armor brand and we partnered with Safari Land um, to develop all the ballistics for us. So they build our ballistic and our plates. We have in-house sew capability, in-house design capability. So we are literally making armor uh, for for our clients now, which gives us the ability to work on very specialized projects because we, we deal with everybody from a small local police department to you know tier one units right. and, and international counter-terror units. And so it's given us the ability to take these very specialized missions and build very specific equipment for uh you know for those units and uh so you know you you come full circle to the first guy who is saved by a project seven vest which you know happened not that not that long ago uh i found out sitting in my car i remember it clearly sitting in my car waiting for my daughter getting her hair cut and and i knew that one of their guys had been shot and you know we were trying to get information on it because they were in our armor and uh, a friend of the family called me and said, hey, this is what's going on. And this is, you know, what happened to him. He was shot seven times. He was shot in both arms, a shoulder, a hip, uh, kind of low abdomen, and then twice in his vest. Wow. And and it, nobody really knew how many times he'd been shot and what happened. And so I talked to his family friend, who's the chief of police at another agency. And he said, he said, oh, yeah, man, your, your, your vest saved this kid's life. And I, I sat there and cried. I mean, I sat in my car and cried because it was like everything we had done, all the effort we had put into it had come to fruition. And, and subsequently getting to know this, this guy, Jordan, who's, who's was saved by the armor. I mean, what an amazing guy, what a fantastic, you know, legacy as a brand. And it's just, uh, that's kind of why I stayed in this tactical space, I really believe I can do more good in the seat I'm in, enabling, you know, guys like you who are putting themselves in harm's way for other people, right? It's, it's very easy to become jaded to law enforcement in the military, but it's, it's, you know, you have to stop and think about whether you would put yourself in a potentially deadly situation for someone you've never met. Right. And, so and maybe never will, you know, so it's, I'm, I am very fortunate in that I get to serve people who do that every day all over the world in, in state and local federal and DOD. And it's, you know, I, I feel like the, the whole story arc ends up in a place where I, I have the best job in the world working with amazing people. And, uh, and I don't think that would have been the case if I had continued to practice law. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, when I heard your story, that's part of the reason I definitely wanted to have you on because it's such a powerful why, because it's something you don't think about. You don't think about it on this side of the house either, because, you know, you get training, um, purchasing, whatever, obviously training is involved in it, but purchasing gets the body armor or whatever. And, you know, hey, I got to go grab my vest and every five years or whatever, they're going to send you an email and annoy the crap out of you until you come and get the new one. And, you know, you, you don't even think about that. And you think of it kind of in the way you might go to Walmart or you might go to Amazon and purchase something else, even though this is a life-saving device and you don't really think about the person and the company that's behind that product that's getting it to you that very well might save your life one day. Something that is, go ahead. One of the, one of the best things about the, the save with, with Jordan was he said, Hey, I asked him if he would come and talk to our staff and he said, yeah, I want to meet the people that saved my life. And so we brought him into a, we had an all, an all hands meeting uh, about marketing and kind of just, you know, normal business stuff. And we ended that meeting before lunch with a slide that just said, you know, P701. And I said, you know, we started this thing specifically for a reason. And that reason was to protect and to save somebody. And every day you guys are putting yourselves into this and focusing on this and you never really have an opportunity to see, you know, the byproducts of that. We knew when we started this brand, we would save someone's life. We didn't know who it would be. We didn't know when it would happen, but we knew that we needed to focus on doing it. And fortunately, you know, we're building a product that can do that. Isn't that right, Jordan? 
yeah. and he got up and told the story. And I mean, there was not a dry eye in the place. Uh, sure. it, it came full circle and it was like, you know, you, you look at your gear like you look at your brakes on your car. It only matters when they don't work. <laughs> it's a good analogy. But there's somebody who designs that brake yep. who makes it work every time. And, and so that's, that's the way we look at our job is, is if I do my job perfectly, you don't think about your gear. That's perfect. Yeah. That, that is very powerful. And something else I kind of came to mind as you were talking, uh, you talk about the tactical space, uh, but over the last 20 years and even more so in recent times, there's definitely been this merger where a lot of your frontline officers are becoming your tactical guys especially as we've moved away from, um, and we've seen some recent situations as well, as we've moved away from barricaded subject protocols and moved more towards active shooter training and active shooter protocols where you have your very first deputy or your very first officer going into that school or mall or whatever, and they are your tactical guy. And they may be taking on a shooter with a rifle or whatever the situation may be by themselves with no backup. So uh, how has that progressed or have you seen those kind of changes like in the equipment side of it and some of the things that you've had to bring to market and worked on? So it's interesting. I just actually wrote an article for police and security news talking about lessons learned for active shooter programs, because obviously the Evaldi incident calls into question everybody's active shooters. You know, I, I remember when Columbine happened and people saying, oh, this is never going to happen again. This will never happen again. We're never going to do this. and and, and obviously it, it did. Yeah. And um, I, I think I think we are making as a society we are making a lot of unconscious choices. And those unconscious choices, and there's what they call the law of unintended consequences. An example I always use in explaining this is Dalmatians. Okay. So, thirty percent of Dalmatians are deaf, either in one ear or both ears. Interesting. And the reason 30% of Dalmatians have hearing problems is because the gene that selects for hearing also selects for spots and blue eyes. So as they bred spots and blue eyes, they selected deafness. Interesting. We are, and that's an unintended consequence. Right. We are doing the same thing with our law enforcement, right? As a society, we are spending our time second guessing every tactical decision somebody makes we are pushing away from the you know the guardian mindset of people who are willing to i recently had ed hinchy on our podcast who's a shooting survivor and runs the safari land saves program and ed put it best he said you have to have somebody that can consider the old lady and go by periodically and say hi to her because she's alone and and take her groceries but be willing to to visit incredible violence on another human being at a second's notice to save somebody. Yeah. And we, as a society, we don't, we've become so comfortable. We're so far up the Maslow triangle that we don't want to think about the fact that the sausage has to be made somewhere. Yep. And, and so we, we want police officers now that are community friendly and really nice and have never been in trouble and, you know, agencies are selecting for guys that stay out of trouble, guys that avoid difficult assignments. You know, it used to be that the guy that worked narc, that had worked street dope, and then worked a narc assignment, and then worked some kind of major narc assignment, and then worked SWAT, like that was the guy that was getting promoted. Yep. Now it's the guy that spent his entire career in admin. True. And, and he spent his entire career in admin avoiding those difficult situations. And, you know, it's, it's the guys that, that I'm interviewing on the podcast would never make it off probation now because they were guys that were looking for trouble. They were guys that were willing to go into dangerous neighborhoods and they were willing to harass, you know, criminals and, and like go looking for trouble. And so in the process of doing that, and, you know, I mean, I've talked to, to administrators and agencies that are like, well, we don't hire military guys because, you know, a lot of them have PTSD and they've all been in, you know, like, these, these violent situations. We don't want people that are violent. Yeah. Well, the consequence of all those decisions is you have 300 police officers at a location for an hour and 17 minutes. Yeah. And children are being actively murdered while they're there 
they're putting on hand lotion and they're looking at their cell phones. And you saw what happened when Bortec got there and you had like guys that were tactically oriented, tactically prepared, were like, no, we're going to solve this. And it was over in minutes. Right. Um, I think that, that to, to circle around to what you're saying, I think if we want to have effective actor shooter preparation, we do need to push tactics down to the lowest level. We need to push equipment down to the lowest level. But that means that we've got to spend time training our police officers. We have to, we have to you know, like we've gone away from fighting at academies. We've gone away from, I mean, there, there's an academy. I recently talked to an academy administrator. The academy gives the kids yellow cards. Okay. And if you're in stress and you feel like they're picking on you, you can put up a yellow card and they'll stop picking on you. For the love of God. Yes. True which, story. Which, I mean, I, I, yes, true story. Swear to God. And, and I, you know, my, my response was, man, that's awesome. Um, do you think that's going to work on the crook that's beating the shit out of her and taking her gun? Yeah. No, I don't think it's going to, uh, criminals do not follow yellow cards, but it's, it's, we've kind of reached that point. And, and so one of the things that I advocated in this article is the idea of, yes, we need to push tactical skills down to the lowest levels in police departments. Because it is the two-year police officer that's going to be driving by the school yep. when the active shooter kicks off, and that kid's going to have to roll in and deal with it. And if he's never done force-on-force -force training, and yep. if he doesn't have a rifle, and he doesn't have a plate rack, and he doesn't have breaching ability, yep. like we're setting him up to be killed or to do nothing. Right. And one of those two things is going to happen. I don't even know what to say. I'm still in shock from the yellow card statement. I'm assuming that was a that wasn't the state of Florida. I'm assuming one thing, yeah. one yeah. thing that I noticed down here that uh, it's, we started doing. So I trained at the Academy as well. One of the local uh, law enforcement academies. And one of the things that we started doing or, or that came down from the state, I want to say it's probably been two to three years ago was requiring a communication portion to where the kids, I say kids only because they feel like kids these days, but the cadets who- Because they're kids, yeah. I was going to say, I felt like a father uh, with my first patrol squad when I made sergeant, but um, the uh, younger people that are coming into this uh, profession, they're coming into the academy and they can't communicate with people and they don't know what to do when that communication turns um, where you don't agree with each other. So one of the facets that they require is what they call morning brief, where they actually sit there and they take 10, 15 minutes and they have to bring up a divisive topic. And then they have to defend their device, divisive topic. And then that way, um, it doesn't matter whether you like it or don't like it, you have to at least have the conversation and be able to articulate where you stand on it. And both um, they, the one presenting and the class then goes back and forth. Because the state realized, the state of Florida, that we've got a whole generation of law enforcement officers coming out that can't even communicate, let alone something where they would need a yellow card because they don't like what is happening or it's too much. Lord forbid where we go as a profession with that. Well, I, I remember, so when my son was in sixth grade, the school coach got up and gave a, a spiel about, you know, we're going to do sports and uh, you know, it's a very academic school he's going to, and, you know, a lot of kind of doctor's kids in private school. And this guy gets up and he gives this long conversation about, you know, we're going to do non-threatening sports. There's going to be no contact. And, you know, we're going to make sure the kids all have fun. And he goes through this whole thing. And uh, I walk up to him afterwards and said, hey, coach, you know, I'm John Becker, his son is Jonathan. He says, yeah, I said, if he sucks at something, do me a favor and tell him he sucks. Don't blow sunshine up his ass. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't I don't want my kid to become what I see applying for jobs. Exactly. Right? Like we, we human beings engage conflict all the time. And and if we lose our ability to make, you know, to handle conflict, one of two things happens from it. We, we either cower from it yep. or we react violently to situations we shouldn't. Absolutely. Like you've got to learn to modulate your emotions. And, and unfortunately, I think as we're giving everybody seventh prize trophies, we've kind of moved to this world where it's like everybody's special, everybody's unique, you know, you're a magic sunflower. And then, you know, you come to work for me and you write something and I go, hey, this is really bad. You need to go rewrite this and you go into a crying fit and quit your job. Right. You know, it's just, 
it's and especially in law enforcement where your entire job is conflict yep right there's 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 almost there probably is never a day that goes by that you are not dealing with some kind of conflict yep. somebody's mad at somebody somebody's fighting somebody's violent you are engaging somebody who's unhappy that you're there and if you can't control your emotions and you are not confident you are more likely to get into a dangerous situation and i think we have kind of down selected a, a population now that you know we end up with and and you've all these the recent example but there's plenty of examples you know going back through history you've all these the most glaring because we have video of everything and right. you know and it's hard to watch they're, no it's terrible i mean i yeah. i i sat there and watched the entire hour and 17 minutes and you know that's that's with the news station filtering out the sounds of kids screaming. Right. Which, which I appreciate them doing for the family standpoint, but I don't think they should have done from a standpoint of society. We need to be less sensitized or desensitized to violence. Yeah. Because we have this, like, we're very comfortable. We're very safe in the United States. And even in bad areas, we're very safe. Yep. I don't go to bed worrying about somebody killing my family, right? And, and so the result is we start to think about higher things on the Maslow Triangle. And it's like, well, I don't want police officers that are rude. I don't want a police officer who, you know, pulls me over and shines a light in my face. Because, right. uh, you know, that's offensive to me. And it's like, yeah, well, that's necessary for his safety. Well, I'm less concerned about his safety than I am, you know. I mean, you can look at what's happened in Portland, in Seattle, in, yep. you know, in San Francisco, like, we're 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 pushing away what we need to keep us safe yeah and and we won't figure it out until you know we get shoved back down the maslow triangle yep um it's it's sad but it's true i i couldn't agree with you more and one more thing before i would segue into really what we want to talk about today on the uvalde uh tragedy is i also personally see it as a leadership crisis too i think it really speaks to the leadership yes. crisis we have in this country i don't know what your thoughts are well on that, we but we i completely agree with you we and you see with our politicians right we we are picking leaders who are self-absorbed who are focused on their careers like i refer to the to me the difference between a leader and a manager is that a, a manager does what's good for their career and a leader does what's right i like it um and and i grew up surrounded by leaders right who, who were leading people in combat and whose lives depended on each other. And so that was my role model of this is, this is what a man is, right? You know, man figuratively, because there are women that are, you know, Absolutely. fantastic leaders. Um, but this is what, this is how I'm supposed to act. It, it, you know, I'm supposed to be responsible when things go poorly. Yep. And, and so it's, you know, I, I teach a class actually, I've taught it for several, several tactical organizations on culture centric leadership. And it's all focused on trying to drive the right culture to drive behavior, right? Because we, whether we realize it or not, culture is what ultimately undermines, underlies our, our behavior. Right. And I always give the example of like, you know, there's a culture in your buddies. There's a culture in your church. Those two probably don't mix very well. No, never have. Right? There is a code of behavior when you're drinking with your pals. There's a code of behavior when you're talking to your mom and there's a code of behavior when you're going to church or you're in a business meeting and, and you know what, what's appropriate and not appropriate based on that culture. Yeah. And so we tend to make that culture accidentally. And as a leader, we need to make it intentionally. We need to, to be creating an environment where we have people that are willing to place themselves in harm's way that are willing to make dangerous decisions, that are willing to flush their career based on their belief system. Yes. And that's, we're actually selecting the exact opposite. Because, you know, the, the woman that will lean in and say, you know what, this is the hill I'm going to die on because I believe strongly in this. We fire. Yep. Because she's so argumentative and difficult. Yep. And we keep the guy who says yes. And, and it, it's interesting is one of the parts of the culture at Aardvark is I don't trust you if you don't argue with me. Right. Because you never agree with everything I say. And, and so ultimately, if I am driving the ship off a waterfall, right. we're all, we're all going to die 
if one of you doesn't roger up there's there was the korean airlines crash in new york several years back like 20 years ago and yep. they said that the pilots flew the plane until it ran out of gas because they weren't willing to argue with the the air traffic control yep right i, I don't want that and and we don't want that in law enforcement we want i want you to get to a scene and be willing to make a decision and and be willing to take action and and then you've got to believe that the people above you are going to honor that decision and support you. Now, if it's a stupid decision and you made it in bad faith, that's a different thing than you really tried to do the right thing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of my conversations with new employees is you're going to make a mistake. You're going to screw something up. You're going to cost me money. That's a hundred percent chance. Yep. The way to survive that is to understand why it went wrong and walk in and say, Hey, I screwed the pooch and here's how it happened. Yep. And this is why it won't happen again. The way for that to be a terminal event is to not take responsibility for it or lie about it. And the Perfect. problem now is we've come to a point where we're picking people as leaders that are willing to lie until they die and take responsibility for nothing. Yep. It's never and their fault. Then Uvalde happens. Yeah. And then Uvalde happens. And yeah. we, we're like, oh man, I can't believe that, you know, nobody did anything. At the, you know, and, the, and the chief, who clearly now, if you see the body worn camera, was in command. Yeah. Immediately said, I wasn't in command. <laughs> right. A term we're using loosely, but yes, he was in charge, if you would. <laughs> if you show up with four stars on your collar, you're in charge whether you want to be or not. That's right. You at least have positional authority over that scene at that moment. There is no question. Yes. Which creates an obligation for you to either take command. Yep. Or give someone command. Yes. But we've, we've created an environment where making a mistake is, is a career ender. And the people that we're promoting have frequently been able to avoid making a mistake. Not, not make a mistake and recover from, but avoid. Right. And, you know, one of, one of the examples I used on the podcast a couple of weeks ago in an interview was, you know, the first guy that found a rattlesnake got bit by it. Right. If he didn't tell anybody, the second guy that found a rattlesnake got bit by it. And that cycle continued until somebody said, hey, I picked this thing up and it bit me and it hurt me. Don't freaking touch it. It's got a rattle on its tail. Yep. Right. And so if we don't want to continue getting bit by rattlesnakes, we need to take honest looks at our mistakes. We need to own our mistakes. We need to have leaders that have made mistakes and have recovered from those mistakes so that they don't make the same mistake. And, and a lot of that, like those lessons learned in that experience was a lot of the motivation for doing the debrief. Yeah. Which is exactly you know? where we're going next. I could spend a whole episode just talking about leadership with you. I find this absolutely fascinating and so needed, but let, let's switch gears a little bit into uh, what you started. And I love everything about it, which we'll kind of talk about as we go through it, but what is the debrief? Let's start by just kind of introducing it to the listener. So the debrief is a video and audio. It's available on all the streaming, you know, basically all the streaming platforms, video and audio wise. Um, it is a video and audio podcast. It is a long format interview show that is me sitting down one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, -on -two, depending on the, on the interview um, and going into great depth with either leaders or legends in the tactical community, people that have particularly interesting angles on tech, or training, or people that have survived, uh, you know, significant events, and kind of walking through their career, walking through an experience, walking through something that they've developed from a technology standpoint, and really kind of running it to ground over the course of, you know, most of the interviews are about an hour or two, you know, we've done a couple of two-part episodes that are going to be released uh, that are two-hour interviews, but it's, it's roughly an hour. And it's, it's the goal is to get a very deep level of knowledge captured on audio or video before we lose it. And then take that lesson of, you know, somebody getting bit by a rattlesnake and push it as broadly as we possibly can. Because there are so many bright tacticians that no one will ever hear from. And part of that is because if they're not teaching all over the country, you've never heard of them. And part of that is the guys that are really doing the job right now, 
frequently are silent professionals. Yes. And many times have so, to be. Yes. Yes. And, and, and honestly, many of the best operators I've ever known, no one will ever know did what they did. Yep. And so what, what happened, the, the triggering event in the, in the origin story of the debrief, the triggering event is um, one of our friends who's a guy named Tim Anderson. Tim was a 06 in the Marine Corps, full bird colonel in the Marine Corps. He was a sergeant at LAPD, ran the K-9, was involved with SWAT. Like Tim was one of the brightest guys I've known tactically. Um, he, Because he had been military and law enforcement, he fused those two doctrines in his brain. Okay. So he and another guy, Sid Hale, who was you know, part of the origin story for Aardvark, right. uh, they came together and built a tactical science program with another guy named Dick Odenthal. And that tactical science program is taking established military doctrinal concepts and pushing them down to law enforcement, right? And, and I'll give you a, an example, like things like the end state, right? Okay. Most people yep. don't think in terms of what's an end state. And so, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of these examples, but we talked about the end state uh, in my second interview with Sid, uh, you know, which is, is where you're trying to go, which if you're not consciously thinking about where you're trying to go, you're not going to end up where you want to be. Right. And if you do, it's an accident. It, right. Uh, Luck played a part. Correct. Yeah. You, you only ended up there because you're like, oh, this is a nice place. But uh, that's not something we're teaching in police academies. That's not something we're teaching law enforcement leaders. Uh, Sid gave an example in the podcast of by the time he led men in combat in the Marine Corps, he had had 10 years and conservatively $100,000 in training. When he became a captain in the sheriff's department, they gave him a new badge. Right. And so, so Tim and Sid and, and Odie had put this program together. Well, when T Tim got ALS, he died. Oh. And I remember standing at Tim's funeral, having a conversation with a couple other guys. And it was like, how much did we lose today? How much did the law enforcement community lose in expertise by one guy going, and we do nothing to capture it? There is no mechanism through which lessons learned are captured. There are debriefs, which which I had been attending my entire career. And, you know, Aardvark has been doing for probably close to 20 years an evening lecture series where we will have a team that has a significant event, bring them in, handpick an audience, exclude the media, take away cell phones, implement Chatham House rules, and like, okay, tell us what really happened and what do you wish you'd done? And what did you screw up? And how could you have done it better? And so I'd seen that culture. Right. And then I see what's happening now, which is we just go on a witch hunt, we write a report, and and we never implement lessons learned. And and when Tim died, it was like, this is stupid. We, we need to be doing something with this. We need to be capturing these guys and sit down with them and have long format interviews and, and talk through this and share it so that a patrol officer in, you know, whatever shoe, Wisconsin, can hear directly from the head of LAPD SWAT. Yeah. Who he will never meet or hear from. Right. And so that was, that was kind of the reason that we did it. Um, and, you know, sadly, little did I know that the first two interviews are with Sid Hale. And, and Sid was a 35-year friend of mine. Aardvark is not Aardvark without Sid's influence in my life. Uh, I'm not who I am as a man without Sid's influence in my life. He was he was an amazing human being. Uh, CW05 in the Marine Corps, commander in the LA County Sheriff's Department, you know, led the Sheriff's Special Enforcement Bureau, you know, four-time combat veteran, like just an amazing guy who also had a fantastic family life and wonderful kids mm -hmm. and was a good friend and like did everything right. Um, and so Sid, I interviewed Sid early on and he was going to be the first two episodes we launched. And sadly, six weeks after our interview, he died. Wow. And so it was just instant validation of we've got to capture our best, our brightest, our smartest thinkers, the guys that are innovating, the guys that are making a difference, and share it throughout the community. And I'm in a very unique position because... I'm not bound by any agency rules. Yep. I don't have any political axe to grind or, or political risk. 
And so like when we started doing our lecture series, the reason we did it was because if an agency hosts it, it's discoverable. Yep. And the media can demand access. And one agency might not agree with another agency. And because I'm a, you know, quote, nonpartisan actor, and it's my house and my rules, and I can do whatever the hell I want, Yep. it gives me the ability to go directly to the right answer. And, and so that was the, the motivation with the debrief is, okay, I know all these guys. I've been surrounded by them my entire life. I can control what is released. Yeah. Because as a, as a law enforcement leader now, it's a very dangerous thing to have a conversation with somebody from the media. Oh, absolutely. You know, you, you say it the wrong intonation or you tell a complicated story and they can cut a section out of that story. Yep. You just became man bites dog. Oh yeah. And, right? and it happens all the time, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. It, unfortunately what's happened is it's created a culture where law enforcement doesn't defend themselves. So you've got, you have an organized opposition that is out, you know, the new one is chemical agents that everybody's going after. And, and it's like, you know, you have an organized opposition that's running around fighting every time it's, it's gone poorly yep. and concentrating those into a story. And, you know, the, the other 99 times that the cops did the right thing and the chemical agents worked and somebody was saved as a result and somebody didn't get killed, could have, we don't talk about that. Right. But it's so dangerous for law enforcement to go out and talk to the media because of that, that in order to actually get these guys to express how they really feel and tell their stories, it's got to be an environment where they know they're safe. And every episode of the debrief that airs, the guy that's on the show has seen the episode. Okay. And if there's anything they're concerned about, it comes out. Yeah. And so you do there it. is no there's no footage that anybody will ever get their hands on. Wow. Well, and you do an excellent job with the vulnerability side of it too, where you really pull the emotion into it and get these guys to talk, which in and of itself is its own art form. It, it, I mean, I think part of it is because I have existing relationships with it, but I think also like people don't understand how emotional the job is. Yeah. And, you know, guys put their armor on and, and they, you know, their emotional armor um, because they have to, right. They have to, like, if, if, if you, you and I talked about this, you know, with your day job, like if, if, if you absorbed every piece of emotion that you've seen over the last 20 years, yeah, you'd never get out of bed. Right. But that doesn't mean it isn't there. That doesn't mean that, you know, the, 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 kid that was killed in a car crash doesn't have an impact on you. And so I, I think when we create an environment where those feelings can be expressed, they're there and they're raw. And, and I think that that's the part of it that we, we lose in this whole thing. Right. I mean, I, it's very easy for us to vilify the guys at Uvalde and say that, you know, oh yeah, they were all cowards and they were whatever. And, you know, there's a lot of, of scorching that's taking place. Oh yeah. There's nobody that was involved in that situation that wasn't permanently damaged by it. Yep. And that feels good about what happened. Absolutely. Right. So whether they made the right decision or they didn't make the right decision, whether their actions were good or they were not or whatever, we we are we are damaging people. Yep. Right. It's you and I talked about offline about Tom Satterley's book, um, you know, and, and which is all secure, which is a fantastic book. He's a former Delta operator, Black Hawk Down guy. Like, if if you have not read that book, you should read that book. And if you wouldn't mind linking to it in the show notes, it is a fantastic Absolutely. book. He he really lays bare the damage of twenty some odd years of being in a tier one unit and constantly risking himself on our behalf. And so I think if we can create an environment where a little bit of that shows through and, and these guys are a little more humanized, I, I think that, that that really will help to serve the community and give people a little better perspective. Because you see it, I see it, 
you know, Sid talks about it in the, in the I think it was the first episode with Sid. He talks about, you know, the guys that are crying in the locker rooms and guys that whose careers are over and like it, it that's what's missing. Yes. In, you know, in the dialogue right now is is in the end, these guys are human beings. Whether or not they, you know they, they make mistakes, there are consequences to those mistakes. They're damaged by everything that they they interact with, and I think as a country we're starting to have this moment of reconciliation in part because of guys like Satterley, yeah, who who are are running the most. I mean, that, you you are not going to you have a hard time finding a more macho profession than being a Delta operator, right? Right, like that's 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 a pretty manly job. <laughs> yes, we can all agree on that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, if you listen to his book and you don't feel like a complete loser and sissy, you're not paying attention to the book. Um, for people like that to be able to lean in and go, hey, wait a second, like, I'm a human being. This is what happened. This is the harm it caused. Uh, you know, the, the third episode of the show, we have Lee McMillian from LAPD SWAT, who talks about an operation that he had where, where a 19-month-old was killed by the team. Wow. And one of his guys gets shot. And you can see the pain yeah right it, it literally changed his career he literally made a decision to leave the best job i mean lapd swat is about as good a job as it gets for in law enforcement yeah and made a decision to test for sergeant and leave after that operation because he was he was so traumatized by it and fortunately he came back and is now running a unit and he's the guy we want leading the unit right because he understands that emotional part he's been he he's does. seen that yeah well, and he's, he's had, I mean, they've made mistakes and he's, he's got, you know, you take, you look at some of the guys at LAPD or LA sheriffs that, that have 1500 operations. Yeah. And it's like, if, if we take people and we're like, oh, the first time they shoot somebody, we need to get rid of them because they're violent. Right. Like that's not the right answer. No. <laughs> the right answer is you look at these guys with gray hair who have been there for 20 years, they make much better decisions. Yes. Right. Do you want your brain surgeon to have gray hair? Or do you want to be 22 years old? <laughs> like, <laughs> Good point. Because you want that life experience. And that's something that sadly yes. we are missing so much. And like you had said, with the way even the emphasis in this career has gone, where we emphasize the wrong attributes for what we want in the future. So I, I love it. And I really want to drive home for the listeners um, this, the debrief, and I will have everything linked up in the show notes, but it is high quality. It is absolutely professional. I, it's fun to watch. I actually watched a couple of the YouTube videos. The um, opening to the Sid uh, episode that you've mentioned a few times, the first one, is, is just a very moving tribute to uh, this hero. So it's an uh, excellent job on that. And I really want to encourage the listeners to check it out because I think once you watch the first one or listen to the first one, you're going to be hooked and enjoy it. What is next for, well, let me real quick. And one other uh, story that you tell that I want to highlight is I had uh, listened to the Ed Hinkey one and you had mentioned that, but it actually, that story, the beginning of it goes into two stories involving body armor and really kind of drives home the why you do what you do and uh, the amazing uh, survival stories of these uh, heroes. Yeah, Ed, Ed Hinchy is, Ed Hinchy is such a good human being that if you tell me you don't like Ed Hinchy, I know I don't like you and I don't need to know anything else. That, that's Ed Hinchy. Uh, Ed, Ed was in a, a place in time for one, probably the most significant event that ever happened with body armor, which was a catastrophic failure of soft armor, uh, which was Ed's partner, a guy named Ed Limbacher, uh, who had a penetration on a five and a half month old vest with a threat it should have stopped which then drove the entire revision. It drove the, the recall of a material called Xylon. It drove the entire revision of the NIJ standards for soft armor and added all the condition testing and all of the, the current standard was built uh, on, the, on the suffering of Ed Limbacher. Wow. And so Ed was present during that. And then just a year later, he is, is shot in a terrible, I mean, I'll let you listen to the episode to hear the event, but the event starts with a naked woman and a baby running into a bar. Yeah. And, and it ends with the suspect shooting Ed three times, once in the femoral and saphenous veins in his leg, and which almost kills him, and twice in the vest. So Ed has watched his partner 
almost died, but you know, because of armor, he has been saved by armor. And now he retires and takes over the saves program for Safari Land, who at that point had just bought Second Chance, who had gone bankrupt because of Edlenbacher's vest. And Ed ties those saves programs together. And you want to talk about round peg, round hole. Uh, I mean, the most passionate guy I know, not only about armor, but about saves and the recovery process from a shooting and what, what happens and what, what gets in, you know, what goes into surviving a shooting. Right. Um, and so Ed goes through all of that and tells some stories that are just, uh, you know, he, he tells the story of his daughter, um, you know, after his shooting, going to, to Sunday school and having a nun tell her that her dad was going to hell because he had killed somebody. Um, which, you know, I, I said in the podcast and, you know, that's when Ed punched the nun, exactly. um, you know, all this while he's convalescing and could barely walk without a walker. Right. Right. It's like, that's it's crazy. It's, it's terrible. Like the stories are just, and, and that's what people don't understand, right? They don't understand like the, you know, we recently had, like I said, we recently had a save and what, what the public doesn't understand is those guys go in and they look at the feedback on the YouTube stories. Yeah. Right. And they might see a hundred that say, you know, way to go. I'm so glad you're alive. But there's one guy that's like, I wish that pig had died. Oh yeah. That's right? the worst part bad. of Somebody YouTube. Unfortunately. Kids. Yes, it is. That's the worst yeah. part of social media, right? It's, it's Ed yeah. describes it as a viper, which I think is a very accurate characterization, but no, I mean, it's, so, so yeah, you've got Ed's episode. We, we still have coming down the road. Uh, I interviewed Mike Hillman, who was one of the original 60 guys on LAPD D platoon and, and one of the founders of the NTOA. Um, we've got some newer guys talking about stuff. We've got a great interview with the uh, York, South Carolina uh, cop named uh, Buddy Brown. They had one of the worst shootouts I've ever seen. Uh, one guy killed, two guys mortally wounded, Buddy, one of them. Um, it, it's just... We, we we're gradually building these episodes and trying to document in time these the leadership philosophies of these guys, their experiences, their lessons learned, and you know, that's why we called it the debrief, right? Because that's yep. that's what it is. It's it's a debrief, and if it if it saves one guy's life, it's worth its time. It's worth all the effort. It's worth everything else. I love it. And it's so powerful. What is next? I know you mentioned there's some more episodes coming out this season. This we're in season one. Is there going to be a season two? Yep. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Wonderful. So we're we're in season one. Season one will be 12 episodes. Okay. Uh, we're ending season one with Ron McCarthy. Oh, okay. Who you know was is also another legend in the tactical community. Um, and then there's you know a few more. We we're talking about. We've got some really cool stuff coming up. We. Uh, the California Association of Tactical Officers did this thing that they call decision-making exercises that if you are not implementing in your department, you should be. Um, what, they're, what they do is they take a group of people, a group of, you know, let's just take it to say your agency. You pull together your team and you feed them. They take a real incident and they feed you the information as though you would get it on scene. So in, in the case, the way Cato does it, they'll pull together, say, 10 different tactical teams, three guys from each team. Okay. Put them on a Zoom call. They say, you know, I, I, <laughs> a naked woman with a baby just ran into a bar, which sounds like the bad, beginning of a terrible joke. Yes. Um, you know, and, and they'll say, you know, th here's, here's the information you have available. What resources do you want? What's your initial plan? So now you sit down and you run through, what am I going to do? And then they say, okay, now here's a little more information. And so, so after the first time, you come back as a group, and everybody splits up into small groups, come back into a whole group, and they go, okay, you know, Wayne, what's your plan? Here's what we came up with. Okay, anybody disagree with that? Yeah, I disagree. We did this, this, and this. And so you have all these different groups feeding back on each other's ideas, and you say, okay, now here's a map, here's some pictures, here's some additional information, go back into your groups. They go back and they go, this is what we're going to do. Here's our, you know, our more developed tactical plan. These are the resources we want. So they do that three times. Okay. So you are forced to live the event. You're yep. forced to make the decisions. And then at the end, they say, okay, now this is a real incident. We have Wayne here who's going to debrief the incident. He was the incident commander. And you hear what really happened, what their plan was, what worked, what didn't work. 
Because the thing people forget is tactical decision making is paradigm based. Right. Right. So, so you are presented with something on the ground that is long and cylindrical and moving. Yes. Right. If you've already heard the rattlesnake story, you know that could be a rattlesnake. So yes. right away, you're positioned to view that as a potential threat of what the threat could be. You then run your checklist on it doesn't have a rattle. It's orange. It doesn't have diamonds on its back. It doesn't have a diamond-shaped head. Okay, it's not a rattlesnake. Yeah. Right? Well, again, you never picked up the snake. You get bit. But I can tell you about my experience of being bitten by a rattlesnake. And I can put you through a decision-making exercise, and it's almost like you've been there. Yeah. So then when you're forced to make that decision, you're much more likely to make the decision. And you're also much more able to get through all the noise and get to what's actually signal. And so we did a, a, deep, a debrief episode with, with uh, Toby Darby and Josh Wofford, both lieutenants. Now one's the captain at uh, in Glendale Police in, in California. And they talk about that. Okay. So that's kind of the direction we're going. Season two, we're just about to start shooting season two. We've got about 20 more people that we're going to interview. Uh, we're going to do a debrief of the Bataclan incident. Okay. Um, so so it's, it's kind of going to be a mix of legends, leaders, training and technology, and critical incidents. And my goal is that in, in each season, you're going to get a couple of each. And then probably starting next season, we're going to start doing kind of horizontal sections of those. So like, for instance, I've interviewed several people this season to talk about the history of SWAT. Oh, okay. And like the evolution of yeah. LAPD specifically. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and recut through those. If you think of those episodes as verticals, we're going to recut through those episodes and take those little snippets and put them together to form an episode on the history of flashbangs. Perfect. Or an episode on the history of LAPD or history of, you know, LAPD squad or the history of LA Sheriff's SEB or FBI HRT or, uh, you know, kind of giving you little short takes on a specific topic. So that'll, that'll launch in season two. Awesome. Well, I will be sure to have all of this linked up in the show notes and I will push it out to the on the blue line community, but I'm excited. It's really great. Let me, John, I can't let you go until I ask you one final question. Uh, it's the question I ask everybody, and it's kind of where I distill everything down. Uh, to have, it can be something we've talked about so far. It could be something uh, we haven't spoken about yet. But the final question that I ask every guest that comes on here is, what is that one takeaway? What is the one thing that law enforcement officers can do that makes a difference in their personal lives, something actionable that they can do right now? So I, I think if you look at all of the people that I've interviewed, and, and I distilled those conversations down to one thing with regard to their personal life. It's balance. The guys that I have seen be successful, and I'll use Sid as an example. You know, I used to joke about Sid and say, Sid is a guy that will, you know, kill without thought in combat, go back to his tent at night, ask God to forgive him, write his kids a letter, probably read some philosophy or poetry and sleep with a clear conscience. And, and that was him. And the reason he was as successful as he is, the reason that Lee McMillian has been successful, Ron McCarthy, Mike, you know, like these guys have a balance to their lives where they are passionate about their profession, but they don't screw up their family lives. And, and that, that balance I have strived for my entire career, right? It is work matters. What you do matters, but you're only effective if you're healthy and happy. So true. So find balance and constantly seek balance between your professional life and your personal life. Well said and great advice. I really appreciate it, John. How can people connect with you? Obviously, we have thedebrief.live is the website, thedebrief.live. But what else? Uh, how else can people connect with you? People are welcome to email me directly. Um, you can feel free to share my email in the in the show notes. Uh, it's just jbecker at aardvarktactical.com. Uh, people are, I, you know, if you have suggestions for an episode, if you have ideas, if you have like, oh my God, you've got to talk to this guy. Uh, you have to hear about this experience. Please share it. And, and if you have feedback, like if you watch the show and you're like, I wish you had asked more of this or, you know, this is new for me, right? Like I'm not, I'm not a talk show. Uh, I, I'm, I'm playing one on TV right now, but yeah. it's, it's not, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to feedback. I want to know how this 
can help the community or how it is helping so that we can tailor what we're doing to ensure we reach the audience as best as possible. Perfect. Well, it's a great show. I really appreciate you coming on. And I really thank you for everything that you're doing and everything that you've done for the law enforcement and the spec ops community. And John, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks much. I, I appreciate you having me on, Wayne, and what you're doing is fantastic. And, and the community certainly appreciates what you're doing. Well, thank you. And that does it for this week's The Interview Room. I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, another great guest will be with us again next week. Uh, we have a great lineup for you here over the next few weeks and on through the rest of the year. So you're definitely not going to want to miss a single episode. Uh, we also have Morning Roll Call, which typically comes out on Monday mornings. However, I may change my mind, and who knows? It could come out a different day of the week. But Morning Roll Call, check that out as well. That's just me talking to you, and it gives us a few minutes to go over something, uh, anything from news or something actionable that matters, hopefully, to you. One last favor, please, 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 whatever service you are looking at or whatever service you are watching this on, you're listening to this on, please leave us a rating and review. Uh, five stars, that would be the appropriate number of stars. If uh, for some reason it's not five stars in your opinion, or if it is, tell us why. We would love to hear it. I would love to get your feedback. In fact, I'm going to start reading some of these reviews on the air. I've uh, been looking at some of the ones on Apple Podcast, and thank you, thank you, thank you for the phenomenal reviews. And thank you all for taking the time to listen to this. I hope you're really enjoying it. You all have a safe week out there. And I will see you next week in the interview room. I will see you next week in morning roll call. But in the meantime, I'll see you on the blue line.